Good morning. It's a privilege to be here today, and I'm thankful for Wayne for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. But I must say, I really do miss seeing everyone here in the sanctuary, and I know we're all hunkered down trying to get to the good side of a very bad situation, but I look forward to the day when we're back here together. Um, it also occurred to me that this is probably my first real sermon, and as it turns out, everybody's watching from home. And so if for some reason I start to bomb and you all decide to start throwing rotten tomatoes, you're only going to hit your TV screens. So I guess there's a silver lining in all of this. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, if, if you'll hang out with me for the next 20 minutes, what I'd like to do is to see, is there a biblical precedent for this idea of environmentalism? And then if so, as Christians, what is our responsibility? And so would you pray for me real quick? Pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, I ask that you will open our hearts and our minds to the message that you would have us receive. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will go before us and prepare us to hear your word. Lord Jesus, I ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. So, from time to time, either for teaching at the uh, science at the charter school, or just to have at home, I'll go to Ingalls and buy a bag of ice. And I always get a little bit tickled, maybe even a tad self-righteous, when they ask me if I would like a bag for my bag of ice, a plastic bag for my plastic bag of ice. And so, of course, I say no, and I walk out, savoring that small little victory to save the planet. But again, this is the same person talking to you who will load up all of his canvas bags, go to, to Ingalls for major grocery shopping, and then leave them in the floorboard of the car, get to the checkout line, and then be too lazy to go outside and go get the bags. How's that for hypocrisy? But I wonder if any of you all can relate with that. So, but I wonder, what's the big deal anyway? This idea of environmentalism, are we getting a bit too carried away with trying to save the planet? Does it really even matter? See, most people tend to assume that environmentalism is mainly a political issue. And unfortunately, we tend to paint each other with a very broad brush. So on one end, if you're an environmentalist, you must be some type of ultra-liberal left-wing tree hugger. Or, on the other side, if you really don't care that much about environmental justice, you must be on the right and a raging capitalist willing to exploit the earth for profit any chance you get. But unfortunately, whichever side we fall in this argument, we tend to offer each other very little grace when they disagree with us. And that's unfortunate. But I wonder if, as Christians, can we go deeper? Is there a biblical precedent for creation care? And I think if you'll hang out with me for a little while, you'll see that creation care is very much a biblical issue that can be found in every redemptive era of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. <clears throat> I think you'll also see that the earth is not just this beautiful backdrop for God to come in and save humanity, but rather it's an integral part of the plan itself, intrinsically valuable and worthy of our care. And I also think that you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, humanity has a God-given responsibility to take care of this creation. So at the end, I hope you'll see that environmentalism is biblical and not just political. Our scripture reading today comes from the Psalms, Psalm 19, 1 through 4, and Psalms 24, 1. Listen to the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And in 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All who live in it. The world, uh, excuse me, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, what do you think of when you think of God. Most often, I think, when we think of God, we tend to think first of God as king who sovereignly rules over his kingdom. And that's fair because there is a lot of this imagery in the scripture. But I think if you look closely, one of the first images we get of God and his character in the Bible is that of a covenant maker. 
We see a God who mercifully renews his promises and covenants with his people after they fail time and time again to honor that covenant. This renewal testifies to the merciful and loving nature of God and his character as king. We see these covenants with Adam and Noah, Abraham, Moses, and finally with Jesus as we remind ourselves every time we take communion. Time and time again, God renews his promises with his people. But as you will see, the covenant is never just between humanity and God, but a three-way covenant between God, man, and humanity. I mean, excuse me, and creation. We have an obligation to both God and creation, and to neglect either one of those will necessarily mean that man and creation will suffer. Have you ever heard the Hebrew term shalom? Generally, that word refers to wholeness in our relationships, wholeness with oneself, and wholeness with creation. A friend of mine named Howard Snyder wrote a great book called Salvation Means Creation Healed. And in it, he suggests that in order for us to find true shalom, we have to live in a right covenant relationship with creation as well as God. And I think if you'll look with me briefly throughout the biblical history, you'll see his point here. So go back with me for just a little bit, all the way to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden. And I think it's interesting to note that at the end of every day, God surveyed what he had done, and he deemed it to be good. God made the land, the plants, and the animals, and deemed them all to be good, all before man was made. So this would suggest to me that Creation is good and intrinsically valuable by itself and does not depend on man for its goodness. Its goodness comes from God, the creator. And then we all know the story. On the sixth day, God made man. And then on the seventh, we are giving this imagery of God resting, enthroned above all of his creation. So he's not only pleased with the goodness of his creation, but he is sovereign over it. It is, after all, his creation. And so... The garden, or creation, belongs to God, but he decided to make man in his own image and gives man the privilege and the responsibility to, to care for this garden underneath his sovereignty. Listen to the words in Genesis 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Note the emphasis here on stewardship rather than domination. And there's a clear hierarchy here. We have the role of the tenant and the responsibility that comes along with that. And so, in Genesis, we are presented with God's perfect plan. But we all know what happened. We rejected that plan in favor of our own autonomy. We wanted to be sovereign over ourselves and all of creation. And once we made that decision, creation has been different ever since. Now, flip just a few pages forward in Genesis, and then you come to Noah and the account of the flood. Because of man's wickedness, God destroys the inhabitants of the earth except for Noah, his family, and all the animals on the ark. God rescues animal kind along with man. And what do we see when Noah emerges? God quickly makes a covenant or a promise to Noah. And we see right away in Genesis 9 this idea of a threefold covenant between God, man, and creation. Listen to the language here in Genesis 9 regarding the emphasis on the promises of the earth and to the promise to all generations. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living thing, every living creature, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Do you see that? Here it clearly seems that preserving the earth is part of God's larger purpose. Why go to the trouble of rescuing creation if it's no good? Why make a covenant with something if it has no value? You see, God's plan is to save people with the environment, not rescue us out of it. Of course, we know God's people still fail to uphold their end of the bargain and must be rescued yet again. And so God reestablishes his covenant with Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. We see in Deuteronomy 28 that the renewed covenant again includes all of creation. But interestingly, the success of, or failure of the plants and the animals is directly tied 
to how the Israelites honor that covenant. We can receive blessings or curses, depending on how we honor the covenant. The earth will not live to its fullest potential if we fail to honor God or if we fail to honor or fail to steward the earth. And when we fail, there can be no true shalom. Once again here, I think we see the evidence of this threefold covenant between earth, man, and God. But I wonder, how do we know how to properly use and steward the earth without abusing it? Certainly it seems clear that we do have the right to use it, but is it ours to do as we please? Can we do anything we want as long as it benefits man? And I think the law contained in Leviticus and Deuteronomy provides some interesting insights to how the Israelites responded to these very same questions and how they viewed their covenant relationship with God. Listen to Exodus 19. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Notice again that we see this message of covenantal stewardship, not ownership. And this is a relationship that is repeatedly alluded to throughout Leviticus and Deuteronomy. What we see is that Israel has been given the land to use and to provide for themselves, but in a limited fashion. And God makes it clear that the whole of the earth belongs to him. And he even provides specific instructions on how to care for land and animals. You see, the law teaches us that it's not acceptable to take everything you can from the land. It must be allowed to replenish itself for future generations. Did y'all know that God actually commanded to the Israelites that they give a Sabbath's rest to the land and to the animals? In much the same way that the Israelites are to rest and worship, God desires for his creation to rest and to recuperate. Listen to it here in Exodus 23. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. So what we see here is a clear concern from God regarding the health of the poor and the marginalized, but also concern for his land and his animals. Let's go one step further and look at Deuteronomy 20. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them, because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. Are trees people that you should besiege them? And so we see, even in the midst of war, the trees, even the enemy's trees, are to be protected. And so what we see here are laws regarding sustainable agriculture, the proper care and treatment of domestic animals, and even how to care for wildlife. It seems that neither economic growth or even national security is a valid excuse to abuse God's creation. Isn't that something? So what we see is a clear precedent set in the Old Testament as to who creation belongs to and the role of humanity to steward that creation. I wonder how these laws would work in our society. I wonder if our current practices that we have now would honor the biblical framework for creation care. I wonder if our continuous farming of lands to the point that they become wastelands or to the point that we must continuously add chemicals to make them produce, is what God had in mind for creation care. I wonder if removing entire mountaintops to get to natural resources is how God expected us to use those. I wonder if clear-cutting countless acres of forest land is how God imagined us protecting the land for all future generations. And I wonder if the factory farming of animals day in and day out, is the humane treatment that God had in mind. I wonder if we're failing in our covenant to God and creation. But what about the New Testament? I mean, after all, we just celebrated an empty tomb and the resurrection of our Savior. Does the new covenant, sealed by the blood of Christ, carry forward this idea of environmental justice? 
And while there is less mention of it in the New Testament, the idea and the theology of creation care is still carried clearly throughout the entire New Testament. For example, listen to what Paul says in Romans. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen and being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. You see, Paul tells us that the glory of God is reflected in the beauty of his creation. We can often see God in a beautiful sunset or the song of the ocean or even right here in our own Blue Ridge Mountains. So how can God's glory be reflected in something that's not good? You see, creation is good, but it's suffering because we have continuously failed to honor our covenant. Listen to what Paul goes on to say in Romans. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that, a cre that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. I think this is a telling verse. Here, along with much of the New Testament, is a focus more on the resurrection and the redemption of creation, more so than the idea of going to heaven and leaving this old broken world behind. All of creation is frustrated. It cannot live to its fullest intended purpose until the redeemed are resurrected. And until that happens, creation eagerly awaits to be liberated, groaning as if in the pains of childbirth. So the earth is not going to be destroyed in the last days, but it will be redeemed along with us. Praise God for that. Or what about when Jesus prays for his disciples? And Jesus says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You see, folks, God's plan is not to take his disciples out of the world. God's plan is to take evil out of the world. And so it seems clear to me that this idea of environmentalism is biblical and not just political. It seems that the expectation is that the children of God will take care of creation, use it, but not abuse it. So why is it then, as Christians, we so often get it wrong? I think one reason is that often as Christians, we see salvation as being whisked away to heaven, only to leave this world behind. But we fail to see the inherent goodness in God's creation. And as a result, a major disconnect emerges between earth and heaven, the here and there. In the Bible, the mention of heaven and earth generally refers to the whole of creation. It's a package deal. But we have divorced the two. We are here trying to get there. And with this distorted worldview, it's easy to see how the earth becomes insignificant or simply the cosmic backdrop for the redemption of man. And so in my mind, the way I see it is it becomes like the set of a play that is used for the story, and then once the play is over with, the set is broken down and discarded. And with this type of thinking, how we use it or abuse it ultimately becomes irrelevant to God's larger redemptive plan. But I think this is a flawed view. Howard Snyder suggests that without a proper biblical worldview about the theology of creation, we tend to drift towards two major ends of the spectrum. One we've already mentioned, which is this type of, uh, where we see nature as a type of commodity and a type of unchecked capitalism, basically use or lose it, so to speak. But then there's another side of the spectrum that we tend to drift to, and people tend to romanticize nature and revel in the beauty and creativity of God's creation, which we should, but then go so far as to idolatry and actually worshiping nature. They fail to see God for God, they see God as nature. And in this case, we don't use nature at all. But as we're all acutely aware in these times, nature is not always a beautiful place. There are natural disasters, disease, famine, and even predation. Right now, our entire planet is being ravaged by a tiny little virus. But it makes me wonder if these side effects are the effects of a fallen world, frustrated and eagerly awaiting the redemption of all of man. So, if you've made it with me this far, 
and hopefully by now you've all run out of those rotten tomatoes. What do we do as Christians moving forward? What do we make out of all this? First, I think we must strive to maintain a biblical worldview of the covenant relationship between God, humanity, and creation. Our actions have consequences, not just for us, but for all of creation. We must remember that we are stewards of God's creation. It does not belong to us, but to God. And as God's children, we are called to be different. We are called to be God's healing community right here and right now. We are called to serve one another and to serve and steward creation. Remember, the whole of creation is groaning and anxiously awaiting the resurrection and the redemption of all creation. The earth and all of creation is not just the backdrop for God's plan. It is an integral part of God's covenant with man, and it will be redeemed along with humanity. Praise God for that. I'd like to end with a short proverb written by Sandra Richter, and she has a lot to say on this subject. But she says here, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. You may make use of it in your need, but you shall not abuse it in your greed. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray you will cultivate in our hearts a respect and love for your creation. I ask that you will teach us how to use our resources in a manner that bring you honor and glory. Show us how to be vessels of love and mercy for all the creatures of this earth. Help us to care and love for all of the beautiful creation you have entrusted us with. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Amen.